Colonel Main proposed to repeat the North African experience, parachuting behind enemy positions, disrupting the enemy supply lines and communication networks. But in addition, they would train and equip the French resistance fighters, the Maquis. Before the SAS arrived, we only had missions of local resistance, like making equipment and explosives. We scattered the herds that were requisitioned for the German troops, making a few small attacks. But it was not enough to be qualified as military interventions. So the dropping zone was behind this lake. It's hard now to realize because there were absolutely no trees in 1944 and all the parachutes were landing there. There were lots of parachute deliveries between July 15th and August 15th. This is where all the weapons and clothes were arriving and the supplies as well for the English. So we received lots of guns. We got machine guns. They were completely new. We got lots of ammunition, which allowed us to equip the newly arrived in the Maquis, in platoons and then in companies. We endeavored to avoid detection, putting our camps in the woods or on the hills. And when we came out, it was to do a particular job if possible, unobserved, and as fast as possible. In trademark SAS style, soldiers worked in small groups, striking the enemy in hit-and-run attacks before disappearing back into the forests. We had so many enemies to fight. Firstly, the Germans, then the French that felt they could get something out of it by shopping us and telling the Jerry's where we were. And then we had the white Russians, who were the police that the Germans used to keep the French under control. And then, last of all, were the Marquis, where we were training most of these resistance fighters. But you never knew who was with you. And we did have strict rules of where we camped. It was always well away from any French camp. With so many enemies to fight, the only thing missing was Paddy Main himself. While we were in France, uh, we had the occasion where Paddy was now had become a desk soldier in Whitehall, <coughs> which he was chanting at the bit to break away from. So for a change, he said he was going to fly out on the night, drop to us with food, uh, and fly over us to try and get the feel of the ground. Paddy Main arrived here. But I didn't know who this man was when he arrived next to me. He landed next to me and he folded his parachute. I helped him take off his harness. And then he took off his helmet and gave it to me and told me, it's for you. I knew only the next morning who this man was. Captain Byrne told me that he was Colonel Paddy Main. For his brilliant leadership and disregard for danger while in France, Main was to be awarded a third DSO. In addition, the post-war French government awarded him the Légion d'honneur and Croix de Guerre, the first foreigner to receive such an honor. As one SAS veteran recalled, our job was about killing, resting, killing, and resting. The war did something to you. You became almost a sadist. And Paddy was the best professional killer I have ever seen. In August 1944, France was liberated. However, many SAS soldiers would never leave. Joint French and British war cemeteries dot the countryside, commemorating the sacrifices of the Maquis, the SAS, and other fallen comrades. René Brossier runs his own museum, dedicated to the memory of the SAS. Of the articles on show, the helmet given to him by Paddy Main takes pride of place. 
So great was René's respect for the Irishman that he wore the helmet when he joined the French Special Forces to fight in Vietnam. As the Allies advanced on Germany in late 1944, the role of the SAS changed again. They were now a conventional attack group, facing some of the best fighters in the German army. Casualties mounted in the hand-to-hand -hand carnage. Outside Oldenburg, the war reached its bloodiest, and for Maine, its most controversial. In the spring of 45, the SAS was leading the advanced assault. Paddy Main received a message that his squadron was pinned down by enemy fire, many of them wounded. We were on patrol in front of the Canadians, and uh, just a string of jeeps, and we were taking turns to be lead jeep, and I happened to be in the lead jeep, and we came under very heavy fire from a farmhouse about 60, 70 yards away. And we bailed out of the jeep, the driver was hit, I bailed out of the jeep, and we went into a ditch. But we couldn't get back because there was a culvert. We couldn't get through it. So we were stuck. And Paddy saw that, and he just got in his jeep, got a driver, got in the jeep, and he came up, all guns blazing, under fire, leaned out and says, I'll pick you up in a minute. Went up the road, turned around, came back again, picked us up. Under fire the whole time. Heavy fire, too. We didn't get hit. You know, the boy, I mean, Damn great target, wasn't he? But never got hit. Under heavy fire, Maine rescued the wounded, lifting them one by one into his jeep. Not only did he save his squadron, he also destroyed the enemy gunners, almost all single-handedly. For this action, he was recommended for the highest military decoration, the Victoria Cross. Paddy was very shabbily treated in that if a man is worth four dear souls for valour, surely he's worth the VC. And of all the work, and everybody says what wonderful work we did, there was not one man of the SAS who got the VC. The Victoria Cross is awarded for an act of individual bravery uh, under enemy fire. Paddy should have had it ten times over. And you can ask any wartime serving SAS that's left, what does he think of that comment? And I'm sure you'll get your ears blasted. The Irish definition of a gentleman is somebody not totally concerned with getting on in life. That would take in Blair Main. He wasn't concerned with getting his VC. He was concerned with doing his job with the style and panache that he had. And I don't think he gave it down. He probably regarded it as a reflection on them rather than himself. So while his VC recommendation was signed by Field Marshal Montgomery, Maine received instead a fourth DSO. David Sterling called it a monstrous injustice. In a letter to Paddy Maine, General Laycock wrote, the authorities do not know their job. If they did, they would have given you the VC. While the reasons for denying Maine the VC were never published, it was probably due to the incident where Maine hit his superior officer. Jeffrey Keyes. Um, we ended up in Norway taking the surrender of the Germans at Stavanger and uh, Bergen. The Germans' the atrocities north of Bergen were pretty severe and we were looking for those that committed those crimes. The uh, announcement of the disbandment was done so quickly it was unbelievable. All of us were spread up and down Norway and from there we were called back and we arrived at Chelmsford. And this general from War Office stood up and said, gentlemen, as from this moment SAS is no, no longer exists, it's been disbanded. And somebody in the group shouted, why? He said, well, we don't want gangsters in the British Army. The army just wanted to get rid of all these private armies and get back to, as one senior officer wrote, proper soldiering. The army disbanded the SAS and would find no further use for the most decorated soldier of the war. As fit as ever, with the unit breaking.